We've already had the greatest service, haven't we? Oh, can we thank our musicians? I mean, that was such a great set. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. So good. Um, It is good to be back. Uh, I've been away for a couple weeks. Every summer, I get to take a few weeks off to be away. And what do I do over those weeks? I pray a lot. um, I study a lot. I see your faces as I pray and study. And I prepare all the messages, the series that we're going to do for the next year. So I did that through next summer. So I I missed you. It's good to be back. And I also missed this foundation series. What a great series this has been for us to dig deeper in the Bible. And if you're newer to Grace, you may not know that we're doing that, uh, that we are literally walking all the way through the Bible. And maybe you don't even have a a study Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, go to the Connect Center or to the picnic afterwards, and there'll be a table with a Bible on it. Take a study Bible and jump in for this last part of the series. We really believe that as we open that book, our lives get changed. So I'm, I'm pumped to be back in the series, and um, we're, we're doing the letters. Last week, Pastor Doug started us on the book of Romans, and a really a bulk of the New Testament are letters, and they're letters that are written to real churches and real people and real problems. And so as we read these letters, you're going to go, oh man, this is relevant. This could be our church. This could be a church I've been to before. This could be my home church growing up. We're going to see ourselves and see a mirror, and it's going to help us reflect and grow in our own life of following Jesus. Now, I'm at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians today, and um, when you do your readings this week, you're going to learn a lot about this church that I can't get to fully, but one of the things you're probably going to notice is it looks like there's some correspondence missing. And there is. We know that there are at least three letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and we only have two of them. But you can tell that they're letters, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, uh, your foundation card deck that you're building, I hope you're collecting these. It didn't get here this week. You'll get this one next week. But wanted to give you a preview of this one because this will help us jump into this book. You can see there's a big gift on that. And that's because this church, this Corinthian church, is an incredibly gifted church. You can get a clue from the beginning of each one of the letters uh, of what Paul might be saying to them. And you're going to see that in this letter because here's how it begins. This is what it says. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Now, stop there. Um, You're going to notice that Paul is always the writer of the book, but he usually writes with someone else because Paul knows that uh, living as a Christian, it's it's a team sport. You can't do that on your own. So you're going to see Paul is always linked up with somebody, maybe Barnabas, maybe Timothy, maybe Silas, in this case, Sosthenes. Isn't that a great name? Sosthenes. I wish I'd named my son Sosthenes. I, just, I think it's a great name. So he, he, so he is writing, he and Sosthenes are writing, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, that's us. Their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, take the effort when you're reading the the letters to go through some what looks like a lot of religious language. You don't necessarily go, oh, I think I'm holy. Oh, I think I'm a saint. But Paul's going to call you these things, and all that means is that he is writing to believers, people who have said yes to Jesus, and he also says this is for anyone who calls on the name of Jesus, so Paul wrote this letter for us too. Now, the next few words get to the gifts I was talking about. Paul says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift 
as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. What's Paul saying? He's saying this is a gifted church. You're a church, and God has enriched you. You have all these gifts. Now, we also know a lot about the city of Corinth. It's a historic city. It was located, and still is, in an isthmus in the middle of Greece. It was this perfect location between the north provinces of Greece and the southern provinces of Greece. And uh, it was really strategic where Corinth was. And it was a place where you went to make it. It was full of opportunities. If you went from one side of Greece to the other, you had to go through Corinth. And if you went from east to west, same thing. You either had to go over the four miles of Corinth, that's all that that isthmus was and is, or you had to go all around the nation of Greece. So you went through Corinth. It was such a strategic center of trade and economic opportunity. But it has a story past. It had decided that it wanted to rebel against Rome. (laughs) That didn't go over very well. So Rome leveled the city. And for a hundred years, the city was kind of nothing. And then a guy named Julius Caesar, he rediscovered Corinth. And he saw how strategic it was. And he turned it into a Roman colony. And all of a sudden, this city literally blew up. It became one of the biggest and the most influential cities in the world. It was really populated. It was really diverse. People were just drawn to Corinth because they thought it was a place where they could make it. There was all this money there. There was all this success there. And there was all this really wild and hard living. The Corinthians, they got this reputation. The verb Corinthianize became known in that time to mean sexually reckless and overindulgent. On the top of Corinth, and if you go today, you can still see it, there's this temple to the goddess Aphrodite. And there they had hundreds of temple prostitutes. This was a wild, hard city. And this wasn't the only temple in Corinth. There were temples to Apollo and to Hermes and to the God of healing. And even a temple that was for all the gods, just in case they missed any. You went to Corinth to try it all. You went to worship any God you wanted, any religion. You went to get every sensual experience you can imagine. You went to find any business opportunity. And the new Christians that Paul is writing to in Corinth, in this church that Paul had planted, this was their world. And this was them before they met the Lord. In the book of Acts, you can see that Paul uh, went to Corinth on his second missionary journey, and he actually spent 18 months there planning this church, and that was a long time for Paul. So he actually knew these people. He knew their life. He knew their struggles, and he kept sending other Christian leaders there to check on them and to disciple them. So he knew what was happening there. When you're reading this week, you're going to come across a phrase that says, now concerning, now considering worship, now concerning sexual immorality, now concerning marriage, now concerning communion. Well, that means he is responding to what he has heard is going on in their city and in their church. And he's writing in this very pastoral way. Because he wants these new believers to live into their identity as followers of Jesus. He knows they're really gifted. That's where we started in the beginning of Corinth. But he also knows they are really challenged living out their faith 
in the context that they're in. Does that sound familiar? Should. Living your faith where you are is where the rubber meets the road in our faith. Right? So we can learn from this Corinthians church. Now, as I said, he knows they're gifted. They're go-getters. And they have all these challenges. And as you read, you might be really surprised at all the gifts they have as a young, very new believing church. They prophesy. They teach. They lead. They have all this, this, this faith. You might be surprised at all the gifts they have. But you'll be really surprised by all the challenges this church has. There are a lot of divisions in the church. There are a lot of lawsuits in the church. There's the most fighting and the most pride and the most reckless sexual behavior. And there's worship problems and communion problems. You're going to read all this and you're going to go, man, this could have been written this year. This is relevant. You know, there's been a a little banter in our family group chat uh, this week because I I found out that Coca-Cola and Oreo are doing this collaboration. Do you see this? Okay, so what they're doing with Oreos, they're taking one of the cookies is Coca-Cola, one of the cookies is is, uh, Oreo flavored, and... That's the, that's the new collaboration. And then they actually have a, a Coke Zero that is Oreo flavored. Okay, so we're doing a thumbs up. Thumbs up or thumbs down on that. Ready? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this looks about like our, our family. All right. So my son, <laughs> my son and my husband are absolute Oreo purists, right? I mean, and so they are having none of this. I mean, none of it. Oreos and Coca-Cola just don't seem to go together for them. You agree with me. All right. All right. Well, there's a combination in the Corinthian church that Paul wants to put in front of us and says, this combination doesn't really go together. And that combination is they've got all these gifts but they're absolutely spiritually immature. Paul says, this this is really not good. Their gifts are dazzling. I mean, they are amazing. But their spiritual maturity isn't so good. It it doesn't match. Their, Their gifts are way bigger than their spiritual maturity is. And that's what gets us to 1 Corinthians 13. Now, some of you know this. You might not know it's 1 Corinthians 13, but you know it. It's often spoken at weddings, and it's often called the love chapter. One of my friends did a wedding not too long ago, and and they read 1 Corinthians 13 at the wedding, and someone afterwards came up to them and said, that is the most amazing poem that you wrote for the wedding. (laughs) And he's like, well, it's Paul. (laughs) I mean, it's Paul. But we think of this chapter as the love chapter, but really what Paul is up to, his purpose for this chapter is to tell the, first, the Corinthian Christians that they need to grow up. They need to grow up in the faith. Now that you know the background, as you listen to this love chapter, every time Paul mentions one of these gifts that these Corinthian young believers have, I'm going to raise my hand. Here's what it says. If I speak in the tongues, okay, speaking in tongues was a very public, very dazzly gift. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and if I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, 
but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul is saying that, Corinthians, you have all these gifts, but the way you use them, it matters. And the way your heart is when you use them, it matters. Now, let me make this a little more practical. If I preached the best sermons week after week, and I was abusive to our staff, and I didn't love you as the congregation, it would be nothing. It would actually be harmful. If you give a lot of money to things, man, you you just give, you're generous, but you do it so everybody can see it, and so you can feel really important, that's nothing. If you can close the deal at work, and man, you are climbing the ladder, ugh, but on your way up, you stepped on everybody, it means nothing. If you serve on church committees, man, you you love to sign up, but you don't want to serve people, there's a problem. If you're an amazing musician or an athlete, but you are such an entitled jerk, it totally overshadows your gift. See, Paul wants them to know that the gifts are great. They're great. In fact, we're going to talk about them. They're from God. But the way you use them matters. And the way you use them shows your spiritual maturity. See, that's what Paul wants. He wants these Corinthian Christians to grow up. And then he tells them what spiritual maturity looks like. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It it, it does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. When I was in youth group a long time ago, a pastor told me, when you read this part of 1 Corinthians 13, you should just put Jesus wherever love is. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus doesn't boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. See, Paul writes this describing Jesus. Paul writes this describing what people who follow Jesus should live like. And if they were listening, and if we are listening, it can very quickly convict us. See, once we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit gets working in in our lives and in our hearts, and he takes our, our new life in Jesus And it it starts going down, and it starts changing our our values, and our attitudes, and our behaviors. That's called spiritual maturity. We get changed. After this beautiful description, though, Paul goes back to spiritual gifts and spiritual maturity. Listen for the spiritual gifts again. He says, love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they'll cease. Where there are tongues, they'll be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, which is what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. 
Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know, Paul is telling these gifted new believers that they need to grow up. I've been following a friend of mine who has a a brand new preemie, and I've been watching the Caring Bridge site, watching as that little baby begins to grow up. And, you know, there's a little more milk every day that that baby can take. There's a little more development in that little baby. There's a little more weight that's gained. You know, it's true of all babies, isn't it? It was true of you. Once upon a time, you were a little baby. You started out as an infant, and then you grew up. Paul's trying to tell us that we all start as spiritual infants. See, just like you were born as a baby, when you became a Christian, when you said yes to Jesus, you started out as a spiritual baby. And it takes time. In fact, it takes a lifetime to grow and to become more and more like Jesus. And that's why we're launching all these groups today, actually. We know how important it is for you to intentionally grow. You got to come to worship. That's where we start. But your next step is to find a smaller group where you can open up the Bible and where you can be in a community where you're known and you can grow. See, God's plan for you is not that you stay a child. He doesn't want you to be a spiritual child. Paul doesn't want the Corinthian Christians to be a child. He wants them to grow up. You're supposed to grow up to be a spiritual man or a woman. It's God's plan. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But then there came a time, Paul says, I put away childish ways and I became a man. You were made to grow. So what should we take away from Paul's words to the Corinthians. Well, first of all, very simply, gifts exist, and God is the one who gives them. God is the giver of every single gift that there is. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from down from God the Father. It says all wisdom and all goodness and all kindness and all musical talent, everything good, It's all a work of the Spirit of God. As you see the letters, as we read those over the next weeks, there'll be a lot of lists that Paul has of spiritual gifts. And maybe you're going to say, I think I have that one. I think I can teach. I think things become clear when I explain to people hard things. You may say, I have the gift of faith. I mean, everybody has to have faith in Jesus Christ, but there's a gift of faith that when other people want to give in or give up, man, you can lead. Paul is going to describe a diversity of gifts for a unified body of Christ. He said, some of you are the eye, Others of you are the ear. Others of you are the elbow. And nobody wants to be the belly button, but I guess somebody has to be the belly button in the body of Christ. And what Paul says, you're going to read that this week, is that all the gifts are important. All the gifts are needed. So when you don't use the gift that God gave you, ah, the body isn't complete. The body isn't functioning the way it's supposed to function. So maybe the word you need to hear today is, use your gift. And there are other kinds of gifts. You might not even think they're spiritual gifts, but God gives them to you for his purpose. So if you can 
fix things and figure things out, God gave you that gift. If you can remember names, and when you see somebody, you can encourage them because you can call their name out. Or if you really can close the deal, man, God made you with that talent. If you can catch the pass or make the saves, man, God gave you that ability. And if you don't think you have gifts, I'd love to talk with you, because you do. God promises that he gives gifts. And this is a church where if you want to figure out your gift, we want to help you do that. Because God has given you gifts. But God has a reason for giving gifts. That's the second thing you need to know. Here's why God gives gifts. Now to each one, this is in Corinthians 12, right before the, the love chapter. He says to each one, that's all believers, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So your gifts are for others' good. Hear that. Your gifts are for others' good. Gifts are not just for you. They're not about you. Gifts are not just there to make you feel good about yourself or to make you look good. They are there to show people the generosity of God. Whatever you're good at, God is the one who made you that way. So those gifts, they point people to God. And you can make sure they point people to God when you give him credit. Gifts have a purpose. But gifts aren't enough. Intuitively, you know that. The way you live is a much more effective way to point people to God Amen. than using your gifts. Amen. And that's why Paul was so disturbed at what was happening with these young Christians. He wanted more for them. Look at the life of Jesus. The perfect model, right? Jesus healed and he taught, he had all these gifts. They were so compelling. People wanted to be near him. But what really changed the world was his life. See, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus laid down his life. He loved. That's when he did that, that everything was changed. See, love is the real power. Paul says right before 1 Corinthians 13 starts, he says, love is the most excellent way. Jesus said it this way. He said, everyone will know you are Christians by your teaching or by your speaking in tongues or by your leadership. No. He said, they will know you are Christians by your love. In fact, they will know Jesus Christ because of your love. They'll be drawn to him when you love. You know, rather than being enamored with all these gifts, Paul wants them to be drawn to living lives of love. He wants them to live like Jesus because he knows that's the excellent way. He knows that's what will last. He knows that's what they're made for. You know, people will forget your gifts quickly but they will never forget your love. They'll be changed when they experience love. And maybe here's the most important thing. God cares so much more about your growth and you living a life of love than he does about your gifts. So how do you live that life? How do you do it? Well, you need God's help. You need God's help to live out your identity as a follower of Jesus, to live this excellent way. Now, there are some things you can do to help you grow. You need to be in Christian community. You need to find a place to grow. You need to show up every week. You need to be spending time in this book. This is the word of God. When you open it, you meet him. You need to pray because you're talking to him. 
You can intentionally seek growth. But ultimately, you need to ask God to do that work in your life. Because here's what it says in the Bible. It says, God gives out gifts, but God also is the one who gives out growth. It says the same Holy Spirit that gives the gifts is the same Holy Spirit that will help you become more and more like Jesus. I was thinking about a pattern. How, how, how can you intentionally seek that every day? And I thought of perhaps the most famous musician in, in all of history, Johann Sebastian Bach. I know you've heard of him. He was born into a, uh, a family of musicians and, and um, he, he early in his musical career, he said, I want to write music to the glory of God. I want what I do to not just be for me. I want people to be drawn to God through music that I get to write. In one season of his life, uh, Bach actually wrote a new cantata every month. And during one three-year period, he wrote, conducted, and performed a new cantata every week. I mean, this guy was prolific. But maybe there's one thing you don't know about Bach. At the beginning of every one of his pieces of music, he put the letter J.J. You might mistakenly think it's his initials, but it's not. It's short for Yezu Java which means, Jesus, help me. And at the end of each of his musical manuscripts, he wrote these three letters, S-D-G, Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God. You see the pattern? Maybe every day you start off and you ask Jesus, will you help me? Will you help me grow? Will you work in my life? Will you help me grow up and be like you, Jesus? And then you go live your life. You go where Jesus has sent you. You've been sent to your school or to your workplace or to your neighborhood or to your gym. And you use the gifts that God has given you. And then you end the day with S-D-G. You use every part of your life, every gift for his glory and for his good. JJ, SDG, may it be true for you. Let's keep growing up. God, would you be at work in our lives? Uh, Would you, by your spirit, would you help us to grow up? Would you be making us people and a church that is known for living the Jesus way? We are bold to pray, God, that you would pour out your gifts on each person in this church. But would you remind us who they're from? Would you remind us what they're for? And by those gifts, God, would you draw people to you throughout the Lehigh Valley and the world? May they meet you. But even more than the gifts, God, we're bold to ask, pour out your growth on us. Make us more like you. And we pray it, Jesus. Asking your help, J.J. Amen.